All right, let's just jump right in. We're about to explore one of the most important, most beautiful, and honestly, most frustrating unsolved problems in the entire history of mathematics. It is a story packed with chaos, hidden patterns, and yes, a million dollar bounty. So what you're looking at here, it's more than just some hypnotizing pattern. This represents the question, the one that has kept mathematicians up at night for over 160 years. This is a glimpse into a deep mystery about the very nature of numbers, a mystery we call the Riemann hypothesis. And yeah, you heard me right, there is a prize. The Clay Mathematics Institute has put this on their list of seven millennium prize problems. Whoever finally cracks this thing will not only achieve mathematical immortality, but will also walk away with a cool million bucks. But, you know, the fame and the fortune, that's really just the tip of the iceberg. There are much, much deeper reasons why this hypothesis is considered one of the holy grails of math. See, here's why it's such a big deal. This isn't just some abstract puzzle for academics. The Riemann hypothesis is woven into the very fabric of numbers. If it's true, it basically unlocks the secrets of prime numbers. And so much of our modern world, from the secure encryption that protects your online banking to, weirdly enough, theories in quantum physics, is built on other theorems that just assume it's true. So, yeah, we have a whole lot riding on this. So, to really understand the hypothesis, we've got to rewind. We have to go back to the fundamental problem that started this whole thing, the seemingly random, totally chaotic nature of prime numbers. Okay, think of it like this. Imagine all the numbers are buildings in a massive city. The prime numbers, you know, 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, and so on, they're like the basic one-story houses. Every other number, like 6 or 12, is a bigger building made by multiplying those primes together. Now, we've known since ancient Greece that these primes go on forever. But where are they? They seem to pop up randomly, with no rhythm or reason. So our first detective on the case was this teenage prodigy, Carl Friedrich Gauss. And he became completely obsessed with finding some order in this chaos. I mean, he painstakingly calculated huge tables of prime numbers, all the way up to 3 million, just searching for some kind of pattern. And Gauss found something pretty incredible. He graphed the number of primes he'd found, which created this jagged, staircase-like function you see on the left. Then he compared it to this totally different, much smoother function called the logarithmic integral. And somehow, unbelievably, the two graphs were an almost perfect match. It was this stunningly accurate approximation, a giant clue that there was some deep, hidden order to the primes after all. Just as the plot was thickening, a new clue emerged from the work of another mathematical giant, Leonhard Euler. And folks, this was a complete game changer. Okay, so Euler was fascinated by infinite series, you know, adding up an endless list of numbers. He studied this one in particular, which we now call the zeta function. You just take all the whole numbers, raise them to some power s, flip them into fractions, and add them all up forever. So like zeta of 2 is 1 over 1 squared, plus 1 over 2 squared, and on and on. And then Euler discovered something that blew everyone's mind. He found that this zeta function, this thing built from all the whole numbers, could be rewritten in a totally different way, as a product that used only the prime numbers. This was a bombshell. It was like he'd found a secret bridge connecting the entire world of integers to the exclusive chaotic world of the primes. So now, let's get to our main character, Bernhard Riemann. He's the one who took Gauss's observation and Euler's strange function and tied them together using a truly revolutionary new idea. Now, to understand Riemann's big breakthrough, we have to ask a question that sounds kind of impossible. We all know 2 squared is 4 and negative two squared is also four. So what number, when you square it, gives you negative one? Well, the answer is mathematicians couldn't find one, so they just made one up. They called it I for imaginary. But this wasn't just some quirky little math trick. It unlocked a whole new kind of number called complex numbers, which have a real part and an imaginary part. But here's the thing you have to get. They're not really imaginary. That's kind of a terrible name for them. It's much better to think of them as a way to expand our number system from a single line into a two-dimensional plane. The real numbers go left and right, and the imaginary numbers go up and down. Suddenly, math had a whole new dimension to play in. So armed with this powerful new 2D number plane, Riemann realized he could totally transform Euler's function. Instead of just plugging in regular numbers and getting a simple output, he could explore this vast, complex landscape. And he wanted to map it. He asked, 
What does this landscape look like when you explore it with complex numbers? Using a clever technique called analytic continuation, Riemann stretched the zeta function across this entire landscape. And as he explored, he found these very specific locations, these special points on the map, where the landscape's elevation dropped all the way down to exactly zero. Think of them like points at sea level on this wild, complex terrain. And these are the famous zeta zeros. Now, some of these zeros were easy to find. They were predictable. We call them the trivial zeros. And honestly, they're not that interesting. But the others, the non-trivial zeros, they were way more mysterious. Riemann found that they all seem to be huddled together in this one narrow, vertical slice of the complex plane that we now call the critical strip. And here it is. This is the moment. The Riemann hypothesis. It is a bold, simple, and profound conjecture. It says that all of these infinitely many non-trivial zeros don't just lie somewhere in that strip. They all lie perfectly on a single, straight, vertical line, right down the middle, where the real part of the complex number is exactly one half. This is the legendary critical line. So why? Why does any of this matter? What in the world do these abstract zeros on some imaginary plane have to do with real prime numbers? Well, this is the climax of the story. This is what some people call the music of the primes. Riemann proved something absolutely incredible. You start with Gauss's smooth, best guess curve for the primes. Then you take the first non-trivial zero. It generates what you can think of as a harmonic wave. And that wave corrects the smooth curve, nudging it a little bit closer to the real, jagged staircase of the primes. Then you add the next zero, and you get another harmonic, and the curve gets even closer. If you add up the waves from all the infinite zeros, you don't just get an approximation, you get a perfect exact formula for the distribution of every single prime number. The zeros are like the notes in an orchestra that when you play them all together, create the beautiful and chaotic music of the primes. And you better believe we've looked. We have used supercomputers to find and check the location of the first 10 trillion non-trivial zeros. And every single one of them was perfectly exactly on that critical line. But, and this is a huge but, in mathematics, 10 trillion examples is not a proof. There could always be one more way out there in infinity that's off the line. Brute force just will never be enough. There is only one way to settle this, the same way it has been done since the ancient Greeks, with a rigorous, logical, absolutely airtight mathematical proof that shows it must be true for all the zeros, all the way out to infinity. Proving the Riemann hypothesis would finally give us an ultimate command over the primes, confirming the foundation of countless ideas in math and science. And so the quest continues. After more than a century and a half of searching, the question still hangs in the air. Who will be the one to finally conduct this grand orchestra of the primes?